Now, today we're going to share something um, uh, called the unity of the spirit. And this is very important because in the time that we are currently in, we're facing all types of confusing and deceiving things that are going on in the world today. And it is my honest uh, desire to please God in the message that I'm sharing with you today. Now, before we get into it, let's pray and then we'll get right into the word of God. Father, we thank you so much for this time and opportunity that we have to share your eternal everlasting word. We thank you so much for our pastors, the shepherds that you've given us to oversee this flock. We thank you for this technology that you have afforded our generation because you knew the time in which we would live would necessitate us using this technology to get the word of God out to the masses of the people. So I pray, Father, that you will touch every ear, that you will move on every heart. Lord, guide us and direct us in this word that you're giving us today for these, your people. And we thank you so much for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that removes burdens and destroy yokes. We thank you so much, O oh God, for the grace of God that comes upon me to share this word with these, your people. We give your name the praise. We give your name the glory. We give your name the honor, for it is in Jesus' name we pray, and amen. God, we thank you. Now, once again, we're going to be talking about the unity of the Spirit. And as I progress in this message, you understand exactly why I call it the unity of the Spirit. Now, in my time of prayer, I kept using such titles as commander, captain, commander-in-chief, lord of hosts, you know, which are all military terms. Then I pause briefly to ask the Holy Spirit, okay, what is this all about? Since I've never used these terms before in my private prayer time, I wanted to know what the Spirit of God was saying through my mouth. And here is the word that the Lord gave me through the Holy Spirit. He shared with me that war is coming to this nation, to this country, and to this people. It's already begun in the spiritual realm. There is fighting among the people of God, the church. Division, God said, among his people. Confusion. He said, many have no weapons to use or to fight with, but some use the weapons they have to fight each other, which again is confusion. We call them friendly fire in our terms. But the Lord calls it hostile fire. Once again, he calls it hostile fire. Now, uh, Jesus said, my people are fighting among themselves. Now, in the days of King Jehoshaphat, the enemy army devoured one another, and the children of Israel did not have to fight because they were one. In other words, they were united. They were united in prayer and fasting. They were united in worship, in singing, and in praising the Lord together. And so, as a result, the enemy turned against one another and was destroyed. So now let's go to the book of Second Chronicles and let's look at the story. We're not going to read a lot of it because simply, uh, you know, we, we don't want to take up a lot of your time here. But in Second Chronicles chapter 20, the Bible says in verse number one, and it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them beside the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some and came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord God. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule? And in your hand is there not power and might so that none is with able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwelled in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, such as sword, meaning war, uh, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we sh will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. King James used the word help. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, 
whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit it. O Lord God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mathaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the congregation and said, listen, all of you Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come by the ascent of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. And they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, who should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come out against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. And I believe I'll stop there. Now, here's what God is saying to us today. Because the people of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, they fasted, they united together, they prayed, they worshiped together. They became one in singing and praising the Lord for the beauty of his holiness. The Bible said God set ambushments. The enemy began to devour one another. It was confusion in the camp and they began to devour one another. So what, what is God saying to us with this? This is the way that God helped Israel to fight that battle during that day. However, if we're going to fight in this battle and we're going to devour one another, and we're going to turn on one another and speak against one another, there will be confusion in the camp and God cannot work in confusion. Now, remember, the Bible says in Matthew 12 and 25, he says that a house divided cannot stand against itself. He says, every kingdom divided against itself was brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So Mount Seir, Ammon and the Moabites, they all turned against one another and began to devour one another. And the Bible says no one escaped. All of them were dead. Amen. So we got to understand that if we're going to fight in a battle, we must fight the battle that belongs to the Lord and not the battles of this world. Because too many of us are fighting against one another. We're bickering against one another. We're speaking against one. We're not agreeing with one another. There is separation and disunity and disharmony in the church of the living God. Well, this one here is Democrat. This one here is Republican. This one here goes for the, this one. And that one goes for another. Come on, people. That's not what God has called us to. God has called us to unity. So the enemy desires to turn us against one another. Now, remember, the house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, using your tongue to speak against your brothers or sisters is hostile fire, the Lord said. And so when you fight and devour one another, Galatians chapter 5, verse number 15 says, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. 
So therefore, we got to understand that we cannot fight one another. God said, you shall not fight in this battle, but set yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. There are battles that we are not called to fight, and we need to know how to choose our battles wisely. Amen. Now, remember I just talked to you about a war that's coming. God said when this war comes, it will not produce a oneness or a unity, but it will escalate the confusion. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 33, the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So God's not the author of confusion. Confusion is not coming from God. And he says, nor is the churches of the saints. So therefore, if we are the church, the, the church of the living God, confusion should not be coming from us because it don't come from our head. It don't come from our leader. So where is it coming from? The Bible tells us that that wisdom does not come from above, but it comes from beneath. It comes from earthly, devilish, sensual people. Amen. And so therefore, we got to understand. He says it will not produce unity, but it will escalate the confusion. People will turn and blame uh, put blame on one another instead of turning inward and seeing their own sins and humble themselves and repent. Now, let's look at something else in the Word of God. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1 through 3, Paul exhorting the church here at Ephesus to unity. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling in which you were called with all long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I think I'll say that again. Endeavoring or striving to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Listen, people, we have got to have peace among one another. The bickering and the fighting and the confusion among the people in the church of the living God, and not only in our local churches, but the church period worldwide need to stop. Some of us ought to be so embarrassed because of the way that we've represented Christ and his church. We need to make sure that in this season of uncertainty, in this season of global pandemic, in this season of riots that are taking place, not only in the streets of America, but across the world, we need to make sure that we're on the right side. We need to make sure that we're on the right page. And I want to warn you folks, we are not of this world. So therefore, we should not take part in all of the things that the world are taking part in. You know, you're for this movement, you're for that movement, and you're against this movement. And they said, no, we've got to stop. We have one kingdom and we are of the kingdom of Almighty God. In fact, the Bible lets us know that our citizenship is from above. We are born again from above, not of this world. So therefore, we should not find ourselves fighting against one another and arguing and screaming and shouting and going on Facebook and YouTube, TikTok and all the rest of the talks and, and you know, and, and talk toxic stuff because that's, that's not what we should be of. Amen. Once again, Galatians 5 and 15 says, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed one another. Okay, now notice James chapter 3 verse number 16 says this. For where there is envy and self-seeking is this, confusion and all evil things will be there. Notice what he said. All evil things will be there. So therefore, we want to make sure that we don't have envy and strife and, and all kinds of things going on because he tells us that in, confusion will be there. And God, we already discussed this, is not the author of confusion. So we got to make sure that we are one in the spirit. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Now, Let's go on with this. There are some battles that you and I are not called to fight. I'm going to say it again. There are some battles that you and I are not called to fight. They are the world's battles. And we ought to let the world, listen, we got to remember over and over again that Satan is the God of this world. God created mankind. He gave man authority in the earth. Mankind turned over that authority to Lucifer. And as a result of turning that authority over to him, 6,000 years have been given unto man to reign. So Lucifer is reigning as the God of this world. Remember, he offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world and the glory, the power and the splendor, the majesty of it all. So he says, hey, I own it. So therefore I can. Well, he said, well, it's been given to me. That's what he actually said. It's been given unto me and I can do whatever I would. I can give it to whomever I will. That's what he did. And so as a result, folks, understand that because this is what he said, 
and he, he had that authority, he could actually take authority over everything, all the kingdoms of this world. Well, Satan is the god of this world. He is the god of this world. He rules this stuff. But we are in this world. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, he says that we are just are like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're just strangers and pilgrims and foreigners traveling through this land. So therefore, this world is not our home. It is not our home. It won't be our home until Jesus comes and takes it. Amen. And that's going to be the thousand year millennial reign. But until then, Satan has free course in this world to do whatever. But God put limitations and restrictions on him. And when the saints pray, praise God, when the saints do what they're supposed to do, like Jehoshaphat, when they become one, when fasting and praying and worshiping and serving God and, 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 and with one another and serving one another. Amen. When, they come, when we come in unity, guess what happens? The enemy has to be put to flight. That's what he has to be, put to flight. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we got to become one. Remember, that's what they did. They fasted. They prayed. They reminded God of his promises. That's in prayer. What else did they do? They, they also united in worship. They also united what? In praise and worship and singing. That's what they did. And God spoke by his spirit. So when we endeavor to keep unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, God speaks and give us the entire plan and the playbook of what we need to do to actually overturn the rule of darkness. Now, let me say this another thing. I told you that Satan is the God of this world and God put restrictions and limitations on him. But guess what, folks? We are the children of the light. Jesus said you are the light of the world. The city that cannot be hid, that, amen, that's set on a hill. And then he told us that not only are we light of the world, we are salt. Remember, he told us we are the salt of the earth. So therefore, we are the ones that are preserving the earth. Man, I'm going to tell you something. When, when, when we're taken out of this earth, darkness will prevail and it will do its stuff. Because we're the only things with the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, the God on the inside of us. We're the only ones that are keeping the forces of darkness from doing evil. And when we pray and when we do like Jehoshaphat did, guess what happens? God overturns, God overthrows the darkness. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, listen to me very carefully. You got to hear me what I'm saying. So there are some battles that you and I are not called to fight. I know that there's some of you I say, well, I need to go out and protest. I need to go out and do this or whatever. Listen, let me tell you something. Protesting is good, you know, as far as that's concerned. But listen, if you out there protesting and you've not been on your knees, guess what? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. That's not the fight that God called us to fight. Well, there are some people that are called to fight. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King fought in the streets. Yeah, but he didn't fight. He fought a peaceful battle. And he prayed and he preached and he told the people nonviolence. And so therefore, that's the fight that he was called to fight. He was not called to fight and pick up stones and sticks and, and call people on the phone and, and put uh, derogatory statements and things like that on uh, social media and causing hate to stir up in the hearts of people. That's not it. That's not it. Jesus said that war was coming to the church and there's a civil war in the church as it is today. So here is what I'm saying. We're not called to fight this world's battles. Amen. Stay out of family fights. Once again, stay out of family fights. Yeah, black lives matter. Yes, they do. But were you called to that? So if you weren't called to that, you better not be out there uh, protesting in the street. And you're not called to that. I don't care how much of a good thing it is, but we got to understand that this thing has got to go beyond. The kingdom is beyond racial borders. Amen. It's not a black church, a white church, an Asian church. It's not a Hispanic church. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And when we start, when we start learning that all lives matter, regardless to who we are, God loves all of us. The Bible said God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. I hope I don't sound like I'm fussing. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. So notice what he said. God so loved the world. That's all the people of the world. He loves us all. And all lives matter to him because we are all made in God's image. And so what we need to do, we got to make sure we're fighting the right fight. Make sure that we're fighting the good fight. And while we're fighting this fight, we need to fight it in peace. Amen. And not in confusion. Jesus prayed that we might be one. In John 17, chapter, verse number 21, he says, Neither do I pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. 
as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may know that you have sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as you and I are, we are one. Now, are you doing your part to be an answer to Jesus' prayer? Or are you causing confusion? Come on, saints of the living God. We got to make sure that we're keeping unity in the spirit. Praise the Lord. So this is what Jesus, he prayed that we, the church, may be one. Amen. We must remember, folks, that we're in this world, but we're not of this world. I can't stress it enough that we're in this world, but we're not of this world. So you got to pick your fights and pick it wisely, grasshopper. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, let's go on with this. I'm almost through here. We must keep our focus on loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. And loving our neighbor even as we love ourselves. So this must be our focus. Is what we do, is what we're about to say about another individual. Are we saying that in love? Are we saying that with the spirit of peace and unity? Hello? We, not, we need to understand that God is a God of peace. He's not the God of confusion. Now, here's, here it is. Jesus warns that because iniquity will abound in the last days, he says the love of many will grow cold. Understand, he said it will, King James used the word wax. It'll grow, actually, it'll metastasize. It'll grow cold. But understand, folks, we must remember that the church at Ephesus, Jesus, when he examined the seven churches, he talked about holding the seven stars in his hand, meaning the seven angels or the seven messengers of the church. And then he says, I walk among the, the, the lampstand, the seven lampstands. He walked among the church. He told the church of Ephesus, you did all these great things. You hate them. These are the Nicolaitans. You got good discernment. You know, you, you found, you tested those who call themselves apostles or whatever. And you found that they were not. I mean, I know your works, your labors and everything like that. I mean, the church at Ephesus had it going on. You remember Paul spent three, uh, three uh, or three and a half years in Ephesus, you know, and um, John came and preached in the church at Ephesus. I mean, Ephesus had it going on. But guess what? When John looking back at the church of Ephesus after its establishment, guess what? The Bible says that Jesus assessment says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. He says, because you have left your first love. They left their love, their first love. Wow. They did all of this stuff and they were cool with it. Jesus even gave them compliments about it. But he says, us, in spite of all of that stuff you're doing and all of the stuff that you're, you're discerning and all of this and you, you're finding apostles to be false apostles and things like that, he said, you have left your first love. Now remember, he says, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will grow cold. What's the connection here? We have got to protect our love walk. We have got to protect our love for God and our love for our fellow man. Remember, you can't say you love God and hate your brother whom you see every day and God you've never seen you love. So we got to make sure that we strengthen our firm, a firm grip on our love walk. Amen. Don't be outside making derogatory. If the, the Bible says love takes no ill against his neighbor. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think I'll say it again. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so in this time of uncertainty, we must do like Jesus said. We must abide in his love. Look at John chapter 15, verse number nine. I think that's, that's something that we really need to, we need to look at. John chapter 15, verse number nine. The Bible says, as the father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Dwell in my love. Remain in my love. This is what Jesus is telling his disciples. And this is what he's telling us today. Remain and don't leave your first love. And that's love for God and love for your fellow man. Apparently the church at Ephesus did maybe one or the other, but they got it back together. You follow what I'm saying? A little later on, they did get it back together. But Jesus said because of iniquity. 
If we look around and all these things that are happening in our world today, I mean, the rich seem to be getting richer and the poor getting poor and people are losing their 401ks, they're, they're losing their jobs and all this stuff like that and, and people are being duped and deceived and Wall Street just keep going up and, and all of these people without jobs. What kind of sense? This is confusion. This is, and it's enough to make you mad. I know to make some of you make curse. But listen, our love is the thing we got to protect because let me tell you something. Out of everything that you can lose, don't lose your love. Because remember, he told the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation, he says, if you don't repent and go back and do the first works, he said, I will remove your candlestick from its place. So that means your light goes out. When your light goes out, you're in darkness. Well, let me go on. Let me go on. I got to quit. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. Folks, he did not say, let me give you a suggestion. Maybe you need to try to love one another. Jesus did not say that. This is a command. The general, the commander, he is saying, a new commandment I give you, love one another, even as I love you. My goodness, can you imagine Peter and Matthew in the same group? Jews hated tax collectors. Guess what? They had to get along with that guy that was seemingly like a betrayer of Israel. But Jesus said, love one another, even as I... In the midst of all of that, Peter had to learn how to love Matthew. Let's keep going. This must be our ultimate focus, love. The Bible says, now abide faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love, not faith, not hope. The greatest of these is love. So I must focus on keeping my love walk secure and intact. I got to read something to you before I close. <clears throat> it's called The Pregnant Deer. My wife saw this online and she gave it to me and I said, God is speaking to you, girl, because this is certainly in line with what I'm ministering right now. In a forest, a pregnant deer is about to give birth. She finds a remote grass field near a strong flowing river. This seems a safe place. Suddenly, labor pains begin. At the same moment, dark clouds gather around above and lightning starts a forest fire. She looks to her left and sees a hunter with his bow extended pointing at her. To her right, she spots a hungry lion approaching her. What can the pregnant deer do? She's in labor. What will happen? Will the deer survive? Will she give birth to a fawn? Will the fawn survive? Or will everything be burnt by the forest fire? Will she perish to the hunter's arrow? Will she die a horrible death at the hands of the hungry lion approaching her? She is constrained by the fire on the one side and the flowing river on the other and boxed in by her natural predators. What does she do? She focuses on giving birth. The sequence of events that follows are lightning strikes and blinds the hunter. He releases the arrow which zips past the deer and strikes the hungry lion. It starts to rain heavily and the forest fire is slowly doused by the rain. The deer gives birth to a healthy fawn. In our life too, there are moments of choice when we are confronted on all sides with negative thoughts and possibilities. Some thoughts are so powerful that they can overcome us and overwhelm us. Maybe we can learn from the deer. The priority of the deer in that moment given was simply to give birth to a baby fawn. The rest was not in her hands and any action or reaction that changed her focus would have likely resulted in death or disaster. Ask yourself, where is my focus? Where is my hope? Where is my faith? In the midst of any storm, keep faith on God always. He will never disappoint us. He will never. But our focus must be on the most important thing. And I'm telling you today, that thing is love. Making sure that we, number one, love the Lord our God with all our hearts and all our soul and all our might. Jesus said, if you love me, the proof of your love is you keeping my commandments. And number two, love your neighbor even as you love yourself. And in everything we do, 
we endeavor to keep the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Father, we thank you so much for this word. It is my prayer that the peace of God will rule and reign in the hearts of these, your people, during the season of uncertainty. It is my prayer, Father, that we, your people, will follow peace with all men and holiness, for without, you said, no one would see the Lord. Father, it is my prayer that we be at peace among ourselves and that we will not lose perspective in this season that we're in. While all hell seems to be breaking loose, and Lord, we know it's going to get worse. It is my desire and my prayer for these, your people, that we will walk in love and that the peace of God would rule continuously in our heart. It will settle with all finality any question or doubts that may arise in our mind. Father, I pray in the precious name of Jesus that none of us would fall away from the faith and that we would not allow our love to grow cold. Lord, we examine ourselves. We see where we, we've spoken things. We see where we criticize. We saw where we got angry about certain things that are going on and spoke things that we shouldn't have done. And Lord, as a result, we've spoken words. The enemy wants to use our tongue so that he can cause us to defeat the purpose and the plan of you, O oh God, in our lives. We repent, Lord. We ask you to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The words that we spoke, Lord, that are powerless and meaningless, some things that we spoke out of anger, we cause those seeds to die. And we command those words to dissipate, dissolve, and do not affect or harm us or those that we've spoken against. We kill it in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, that we speak, speak words of life, words of faith, words of hope, words of peace, and words of love. We thank you and we give your name the praise. The glory and the honor is already yours. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And God, we thank you. God bless you. I hope that you've enjoyed this message today. Now, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice right now, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Look around you. The signs are telling us that something's happening. The Lord is soon to come. And it's time for you, my friend, to get in the ark, the ark of safety. And that ark is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Listen, I don't care how good you are. I don't care what, what type of pedigree you come from. Your daddy could have been a Baptist deacon or whatever as far as that's concerned. These things don't save you. Your works will never save you. It's only the precious blood of Jesus Christ that can save you. There is no other name, other name given unto men whereby we can be saved but the name of Jesus. Listen, if you're not in the ark of safety, that means you have a terrible place that you're destined to go to. Folks, right now is the time to get in the ark. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's time to get into the ark. And if you're not in the ark and you want to get in that ark right now, you can pray this precious prayer with me. Father in heaven, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I ask you in Jesus' precious name to forgive me of my sins. Save me. Cleanse me from all of iniquity. I repent and I ask you to write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Give me your Holy Spirit to help me to live a righteous life in your sight. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And God, we thank you.